What is a conservator? I guess that's you. Use, that's the most prominent word in your title. What is one? How would you define it? Well, that's what I'm. Uh, I do using the actual books. Uh, I use four books to help get a definition because I. Your, your, the intro to your show was exactly right. A conservatism now is a kind of a, a reaction that doesn't have a positive core. And that's not because conservatism doesn't have a positive core. It's, we've lost track of it. So I take readers back, all the way back to ancient Greece, with Aristotle's politics. I use G.K. Chesterton's orthodoxy, Vogelin's The New Science of Politics, C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, to help readers get an idea of what conservatism really is what it is for, and one thing that, that certainly defines it uh, is that it, it understands the world to be well-ordered. That is, that there is a, a divine source of the world's order, and that human beings discover that oral order, including the moral order, and then can properly act on it. But that means they can also violate it. That is, they have the free will to either fulfill their nature according to its design, or they can reject it. And uh, in, in the course of defining conservatism, I also trace liberalism uh, all the way back to ancient Greece. It was called something else then. It was mm -hmm. called sophism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that uh, the, the core of liberalism is the rejection of the notion that there is a divine order and the elevation of freedom as a kind of fundamental principle, meaning the freedom to do anything you want, the freedom from restriction whereas conservatism is going to understand uh, freedom in a way uh, that is, is, is in a definite moral context. Freedom is the fulfillment, uh, the, the freedom to fulfill uh, our moral nature, in our economic nature, uh, in our political nature. Uh, so that's, that's the main dividing point, and certain things flow from that. Uh, I'll name the most obvious, and I think for our day important, the family. Mm -hmm. The family for conservatives, all the way back to Aristotle, has been the foundation of society, and how the family is treated and understood tells you about the caliber of society. So if you live in a society in which the family is being attacked, reformed, as yeah. if it were clay... Remade, actually. Or re yeah, remade in, in whatever image, then you know that there's something deeply wrong, and we live in just that age. We're having the fundamental cell, the fundamental unit of society destroyed, that's the thing that conservatives, first of all, have to conserve. Yeah, maybe the part of the problem is, you know, what you just said about have to conserve, that has a preservative aspect to it, it has a traditional aspect, it has a precedent aspect to it. With the case of Roe v. Wade, abortion now is almost part of the wolf and wharf of... Uh, Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Of society. So how do you deal with the term conservative with relationship to precedents that are against the underpinnings that you just defined? Well, that, that's a, an excellent point, and I, I take care of that in the beginning because the word conservative can be um, immensely uh, ambiguous. Because, right, right, For example, right. imagine you're an Aztec. Well, the Aztecs practiced human sacrifice for centuries, right. and that practice was part of a larger practice of human sacrifice that went back beyond their civilization. So things can become entrenched in society, uh, and they can be protected and conserved against innovators, uh, but, but there's something morally wrong. And the real conservative answer is a society can act against its nature. That is, act against human nature. It can mm -hmm. set up laws uh, and precedents that violate uh, the, the moral order, and we have done that. Uh, and in fact, people should be aware historically uh, that uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, prior to Christianity's arise, and of course, uh, rise in even after that, abortion and infanticide were common practice. Right. So, in a way, Christians were the radicals. They right, came right. In, what do you mean, deny? You know, we've had this for centuries. Uh, and they did. You so, know, and, infanticide was part of the moral code. Uh, of uh, the ancient Romans, you actually had a moral obligation to destroy uh, any infant that was uh, slightly deformed. So you're telling us that uh, Obama's the Obama administration is just a bunch of Aztec conservatives? Well, I don't know whether they resort. Well, there is the human sacrifice element there. Oh well, yeah, they're definitely. They I mean, on the altar of choice, what is it? I, I well, it, it is true on the on the altar of a certain view of freedom, and you can see it's it's the fundamental anti-family act. There's nothing that strikes at the family in the same way that abortion does. If you can do that, as Mother Teresa said, you can do anything. Right. How, how do uh, conservatives... So you see that undermining the family. How do conservatives deal with the, uh, the concept of change? Well, 
I, I think one of the best um, conservatives to understand this, uh, and, and there, there are many, we can bring up other ones, but Edmund Burke is a good man here to understand. Edmund Burke is, is the English conservative who was around uh, just before and during um, the American Revolution. Mm-hmm. Uh, he actually sided with Americans uh, in this, interestingly enough. And, of course, that would seem to be a really non-conservative thing to do. Well, it's the Irish in him, I think. <laughs> well, and, and he defended the Irish against yeah. the English. And, and that, you could say, well, in the context of Britain, those two things weren't very conservative. Uh, but for him, conservatism had its root in natural law, in the fundamental moral principles that we need to abide by. And when those are violated, a conservative has to restore moral order. And that's what we're ab- about today. We're, we're, we're not about going, you know, the, the last hundred years in regard to how we treated marriage has been awful. We don't want to conserve any of that. No. Uh, we, no. want to, we want to react again. We want to transform it. So conservative regards change as something necessary uh, if you're talking about changing from a worse state to a better moral or political Do you, uh, do you think the word has maybe been overused and so been stretched out of shape it doesn't have the same meaning? And maybe traditional is a better word? Or? Well, the only reason I don't like... Now, th- this, is a good, this is a good debate around the table. Uh, I like the term conservative mm-hmm. rather than traditional because when you say, we're going back to traditional marriage... Uh, but you said, wait a second, what was traditional, yeah. um, you know, in uh, ancient Semitic society? Oh, well, it was polygamy. Yeah. A- and, uh, and monogamy was a radical innovation by Christianity. So, you, you, you know, just traditional well, could, could, isn't enough. Where Christ, Christian traditionalism, maybe. Well, you know, in, in one way it's good, because uh, as Burke pointed out, what is traditional is, is, is usually time-tested. You know, it's got uh-huh. its roots somewhere in common sense, and that's why conservatives generally give the benefit of the doubt to long-standing traditions. Uh, your book is div- uh, divided into four parts. Uh, would you briefly name them? Or? Sure can. Uh, I begin, as I said, with just what exactly is conservatism, because I think there's a lot of confusion. It's not enough to be against the government. That's not a platform to understand how we should live. Uh, then I go to democracy and the founding of the American regime, and here I look at those thinkers around the time of our founding who are looking at democracy, uh, not only of our founding. So here it's uh, Edmund Burke's Reflection on the Revolution of France and Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. And then I go to the question about the ratification of the Constitution. And I'm really pushing this. I put not only the Federalist Papers, but the Anti-Federalist writings. And I... Uh, You're talking about conservatives and... uh, you mentioned how important the family is to conservatives. How about religion? I mean, uh, there are non-religious conservatives, I guess, but how do you deal with religion and the idea of conservatism? Well, uh, in, in this way, um, as I said at the beginning, one of the foundations of conservatism is that there is a moral order in the universe that you are conserving mm-hmm. against uh, human degradation. So that it, that really implies that there is a moral order that you know the universe didn't come about by chance mm-hmm. uh, if it came about by mere chance then there couldn't be a moral order that you were trying to conserve against any degradation and i think that the notion that it, that the universe arose from chance is what grounds uh, at least modern liberalism because that allows mm-hmm. you to say well there isn't anything that i'm violating Right. You know, I can, I can, it, nature and human nature especially are malleable. All moral codes are temporary at best. Mm-hmm. So I really think that true conservatism yeah. must be rooted in at least a natural law understanding of, uh, of, of the universe. That is, there is a God, uh, and he has defined what the moral order uh, is and, and what human nature should and shouldn't do. Like for fiscal conservatives, how do you deal with them? The, the the I'm sorry the what again fiscal conservatives guys okay. I don't like oh, yes. the, you know, oh, I don't get absolutely, mixed absolutely yeah this. this this I regard as radically insufficient right and and one of the things that I uh, to to harken back to a previous question uh, the third section in the book uh, in my book is the place of economics mm-hmm. and I put it third because I want conservatives to remember that it's not just about economics if you reduce conservatism to economics you're not much different than Karl Marx who reduced everything to economics. So it isn't enough uh, merely to have certain kind of fiscal policies. Certainly it's, it's good, but it's not good enough. And I think that our current situation 
in a way, results from uh, forgetting that there has to be a moral foundation for economics to run smoothly, because economics really is something that comes after the family, after the moral order, uh, and it's part of the, you know, it branches out from the family's provision uh, for itself as, uh, you know, families spread into, uh, you know, uh, larger units, villages, counties, states, and so on. The economic order comes uh, from that origin. Uh, so uh, fiscal conservatives, if they're, if they're just limiting to that, are really destroying the foundation of a strong economic order. Ben, all that being said, I'm going to get tough with you now. How come Russell Kirk doesn't appear in your book? That really ticked me off. He is my favorite conservative writer. You know, I actually deal with that just a little. And yeah. the, the reason, and, and believe me, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, wrestling about what books to include uh, and what books to, uh, to, that I would have to exclude uh, merely because I had to get it down to a, a, a right, certain right, number right. of books. Uh, the reason, the reason that I decided not to include him, uh, was that his book, The Conservative Mind, is much like this one. Oh. Uh, that is, in other words, he deals with a particular, uh, influential text. Right. Uh, and so what I felt was a kind of a duplication, and I, I say in the introduction, this is one of the great books yeah. that people ought to do, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to include a book that was like this one, because then it would be, a, a kind of a duplication of effort there. Uh, in my opinion, though, that's his least, impo- well, I want to say important, his least easy-to-read book. The rest of his books are all based on the, the basic principles that you elaborate in your own book. I mean, he's got other works that probably could have made the cut. Maybe they're not as familiar as that one, I guess, is the reason. Yeah, and, and you know, it was very difficult. And one of the things that made it, um, m- not, I, wanna, I don't want to say more difficult, but it made it harder to make certain kinds of cuts is that I wanted to include things that conservatives generally didn't include, like literature. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's a great mistake for conservatives to let the other aspects of the intellectual realm um, up, uh, 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 so that what happens is they get get to be the... uh, that you know the, the liberals take over them in academia, and so that, you know we don't wor- we worry about economics and politics. We'll yeah. let literature go. Uh, we, conservatives don't need to worry about that. Well, I think that's a fundamental mistake because of the effect of literature, good literature on the soul, right. and the effect of bad literature on politics. Women are love to hear that you have Jane Austen there. I've seen all her movies. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> aren't they great? Now that they have movies and they're they're successful, that's yeah, good news. That is good. That is good. Well, news. how did how does she make the cut? She did because uh, she's got a whole lot to recommend her. Um, first of all, no one can say about her uh, that she's one of the greatest women writers of uh, English literature, mm-hmm. because you don't have to say woman. Yeah. Everyone knows she's one of the best writers, period. Well, and George Eliot, we don't know what he or she is, I guess. No. <laughs> well, yeah, well, she's, she's essentially a conservative person in her own life. And I argue, uh, using her book *Sense and Sensibility*, mm-hmm. that she's got she's she's a first-rate philosopher mm-hmm. as well. She's mm-hmm. underrated. And uh, in addition to that, you mentioned the movies. The conservative mind, uh, the conservative culture, needs to be formed by by literature and movies. If you let movies up uh, and don't worry about them as a conservative, well, what's going to happen? You're going to get what happens in Hollywood now. Yeah. I got one uh, more so question. We're going to uh, open for some calls. Sure. I, I, I'm saying your book, it's only about $27, $28, but it's become very expensive to me because the books that I don't have that are in it, I run out and buy. <laughs> you have uh, the Shakespeare's te- uh, The Tempest in there at play, uh, and I went out and bought that. Now, wh- why is a Shakespearean play considered conservative by your standards? Well, first, again, everyone must say this is one of the greatest uh, dramatic minds of all times, and The Tempest is an absolutely wonderful conservative play. That is, it, there's an essential anti-utopianism running throughout the thing, uh, and uh, it, it shows all the basic conservative principles. Uh, that is, uh, you know, why it is we can't have utopian governments, why it is that human sin always uh, undermines uh, any attempts to make a uh, heaven on earth. Uh, And furthermore, what are the basic human characters and foibles that true conservatives must take account of when they set up political society? On top of all that, it's a beautiful reflection on the relationship of God's providence to our actions and salvation. Uh, Tempest has got everything in it. It's a brilliant play.